think we're I think hi it's everyone. Okay. I hope you enjoyed all of today's sessions as much as I did. And for today's final session, we're going to answer your questions. Please use the chat box on the screen to submit any additional questions that you'd like to ask to the team. And we'll get back to you as uh, to as many of you as we can in the next 30 minutes. Feel free to ask anything from today's sessions or general market research questions that you would like us to cover. We've also been pulling questions um, all day from the other sessions. So let's get right into it. I'd like to first welcome back some familiar Susie faces from earlier today. Our SVP of market research, Will Simarosa, our chief product officer, Nick Goshaw, and welcoming a new face to the Susie team, VP of audience management, Doreen Block. So I'm going to get started. One of the questions that came up um, from the audience is regarding in-home usage testing. And one of the audience members said that um, for her brand, they actually don't use iHuts right now. And they wanted to know from, from Doreen, what are the biggest benefits that you see with integrating in-home usage testing and that type of research into their current research processes? It's such a great question, Katie. And I am so thrilled that we are introducing this solution for clients. In-home usage testing really completes the 360 degree view for researchers and really anyone who's looking for product oriented insights. The ability to get physical products into the hands of consumers so that they can look, smell, taste, uh, really experience fully that product can really uncover new insights in a lot of different dimensions, either understanding what the key differentiators are of a product or understanding what the big weakness that might be in a product before scaling up for mass production. So there are really so many different things that iHuts can address and we look forward to supporting clients with understanding how it can become part of their testing plan. Yeah, that's awesome. It's such a natural extension to the work that Susie already does with our clients with flavor testing, naming testing, packaging testing, and to now physically get those products into those consumers' hands. It's gonna be super exciting for us. And in-home usage testing has kind of historically mostly been quantitative methodologies. So running that screener, sending the product, running that follow-up survey. But of course, with Suzy, you can incorporate Suzy Live and qual a qualitative aspect to in-home usage testing. And I'd love to know your thoughts, Doreen, on, on where that might be useful for, for companies. Absolutely. So besides the fact that Suzy is really streamlining the process and centralizing the initiation of in-home usage testing right through the platform, the ability to target those consumers who have received a physical product again and again in different ways is one of the most powerful aspects of this new launch. And so um, what's very exciting to me about being able to support clients with this is that they can absolutely launch questions, full-fledged surveys um, to target consumers post-trial and to understand their preferences and opinions about the product that they tested. But also they can extend that into Suzy Live and into qualitative research. So as we saw earlier today uh, with that wonderful demonstration with Will and Mackenzie earlier, um, that ability to follow up and probe deep in a qualitative capacity, following up an IHUT is something uh, really special and really um, unique in terms of how streamlined it is now with Suzy. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, Nick, just, actually, this, oh, I think you're about to talk about the benefits of, of uh, yeah. having on PAL um, and where that fits into the new process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, we've, we've seen benefits over the years of having our own panel and just in terms of speed in terms of quality and the ability to retarget. Um, what we really realized with the launch of Suzy Live, the depth that we could get with our existing audience, really in terms of the initial setup and just scheduling. Uh, we hear from uh, clients of ours that have used other platforms that they would show up to interviews and there'd be no one on the other side, things like that. Uh, it was really easy for us to set up um, that scheduling and have a really quick turnaround. And then the, the depth of the experience itself, um, just the answers that we've been getting from our consumer panel, um, and just the ability to, as Doreen said, um, follow up later and retarget. So we are expecting to see those same patterns with iHuts and the ability to then um, have you know an item that we're getting in a consumer's hands and follow up either quantitatively or qualitatively. We see that um, those three aspects can really um, just, you know, one plus one, one equals seven 
happen, <laughs> not three. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. And we're gonna, we think we're gonna continue to see a lot of interesting use cases. Yeah, awesome. And just double checking, is Wilson Rosa on the call? I know you were having some audio problems because there's a storm coming here on the West Coast. I believe Will is back. I'd love to know his thoughts also. I'm like sweating. I'm sweating from the <laughs> Hi everyone. I'm Hi, back. Everyone. I'm, I'm back. I'm through audio I'm on through audio phone. on phone. Great. We can see your smiling face, so we're very excited to see you back. But not sure if that storm is really affecting your Wi-Fi there, Will. We will come back to you shortly. But in the meantime, Nick, a lot of clients uh, who are fairly new to Susie and, and companies on the call who are not familiar with Susie would love to know a little bit more about the audience and how we built the audience. I'd love to for you to give a sure. little history to, to CrowdTap. Sure, absolutely. So Suzy as as a company really came about in um, 2017, um, but the CrowdTap um, business and panel had actually been around for a few years prior to that, um, so since 2009. Um, so it's really an audience that we've built over the years, um, and there's a lot of trust on both sides, um, which is why we're really able to get those authentic answers. Um, and the way that we built the CrowdTap experience um, was really caring about the users and their experience. Um, there's a lot of market research platforms that expect people to take a 45 minute survey. And that's just not something that we were willing to do. Um, we really feel like after a handful of questions, um, people lose interest or they're just kind of going through the motions. Um, so to have experience where we're, um, and we actually use CrowdTap ourselves um, to get feedback from consumers about what they're looking for, uh, those types of things. Um, but we felt it to be, you know, definitely a differentiator and um, really an important part of our offering. Yeah, and it's really exciting to see we uh, we measure our NPS scores and our app um, scores in the in the iPhone store um, for our respondents, and that they're incredibly high as well. They feel really engaged and feel like part of the community. Doreen, obviously, you're, you're key to, to understanding how communities work. Um, do you have experience in, in why it's important to have such an engaged audience um, for a market research tool like ours? It's everything. Having the panel that um, and the user base that is coming consistently, providing their feedback over time, it is um, one of the things that I uh, just admire so much about what Susie and CrowdTap has built over the years uh, because it continues to pay dividends for clients. The fact that, again, you can come back and retarget those consumers and learn how their perspectives are shifting over time. You know, as Matt had shared in the keynote, uh, this is one of the key pieces that marketers and really anyone in a brand needs to understand today is not just in a moment in time how a consumer um, is feeling or what they're thinking, but how a given person's perspectives might be shifting over time through different life stages as well. So the fact that CrowdTap and Suzy can connect at that level and keep our audience members truly engaged is um, incredibly powerful. And I'm so excited that we're extending that now with iHuts, because what I've seen in my experience over the years is that when we get a physical product into the hands of consumers, they're that much more engaged. They're that much more connected to the platform. So we just think on all sides for brands as well as for the audience, um, the, the fact that we continue to invest in the audience and into the different features that we're providing them will continue to pay dividends for the entire platform and all of the clients using it. Yeah, that's great. We had a, a, an audience member, Angela, from our first session uh, who shared that she often feels that kind of quant qual feedback loop and hybrid methodologies are a really good fit for larger categories, um, but she was worried that it doesn't quite apply to, to niche industries and, and want to know our thoughts on that. And I can maybe start a little bit. I think in historically trying to reach niche audiences has been very cost prohibitive um, when you're um, and having come from the panel world myself. A cost per interview is based on how hard that person is to find. Um, only our own audience allows us to run that screener, find those participants, um, and then really be able to, to utilize that research um, in, in the right way, both quantitatively and qualitatively. And what we have found over the past year since launching Suzy Live is that our clients who really do have a very niche audience actually have found Suzy Live to be incredibly um, useful when trying to reach those kind of real needle in the haystacks and, and diving deep into, into those behaviors. 
Nick, do you have any kind of thoughts on uh, why niche product uh, companies may want to also use Qualcomm hybrids? Yeah, I mean, I think the more niche you're getting, you're trying to find those insights that, again, as you said, those needles in a haystack that might be in the way somebody answers a question or the things that they don't say or the expressions on their face and things like that. Um, so especially when you have, um, you know, lower quantity of, of responses for those really niche audiences, picking up on those kind of micro behavioral reactions and things like that can be really critical to to dive deep into and, and isolate those insights. And the other thing that I want to add is that this, this capability of targeting niche audiences is going to get better and better over time. So don't be shy to reach out to us and let us know who you're looking for on the audience side, because we're continuing to invest in uh, finding those niche audiences so that we can empower clients with those niche insights. So, um, you know, as Katie had said, this is something that used to be very feasibility prohibitive, cost prohibitive, time prohibitive, but it's getting better and better every quarter. And so um, I think just continue to have an open dialogue with client success and we'll see what we can do because it's definitely something that we're investing in. Yeah. And Roxy, actually, from that same session, um, mentioned that for her, it's particularly a lack of time as being the barrier to her agency um, for their foundational studies, often taking kind of four to six weeks when they're running segmentation. It can often take a couple of months and be um, a fairly cost uh, prohibitive um, uh, solution to then run call quant hybrid after that. Of course, you know, Susie's starting to help break those time barriers. Um, Nick would love for you to talk a little bit about um, why we've been able to provide such speed to our, our clients. Sure. You know, I think we've, we talk a lot about just the, the speed to response. Um, but one of the things we've, we've been really focused on, especially over the last year or so, is the speed to business outcome. So, you know, the, the example that you mentioned, if it takes literally weeks to screen and schedule and set up those interviews, um, especially in the, the climate we're in right now, weeks is, you know, the world might be different. Um, those things might have changed and some of the research you're doing might not even be relevant. So we saw that as an immediate um, point of value for Suzy Live and heard that from our clients right away. The fact that, you know, within just a couple of days, they can be speaking to the consumers that, that they would like is super powerful and it allows them to really quickly make those decisions and actually put those into action um, rather than kind of waiting for scheduling and setting up and screening. Um, that's just time that you don't, that you can't afford these days. Yeah, you're so right. I think we talk about speed a lot as the time to response, but it's really the, the time to, um, to delivering on the solution as well. And of course, automated PowerPoint presentations um, are, are really the way forward. I was just reminiscing with a colleague um, at the weekend about uh, my early in my career where I would be given two weeks to put together my PowerPoint presentations from the lengthy data charts and the manual analysis I had to do and oh, how the world has changed, <laughs> for sure. A couple of questions actually about the, that came out from the uh, audience as well. Um, one um, is regarding what does the future of brick and mortar retail look like as we emerge from the pandemic? Will there still be click and collect? Will there still be delivery? Will people go back to stores? And uh, unfortunately, the three of us don't have a crystal ball, um, but a lot of the work that our clients, particularly Shopper and category, um, category teams are, are running on the Suzy platform are to answer those exact questions for their categories, because it really will depend on the category um, itself, whether it's food and drink or clothing retail um, and even um, uh, nutrition and so on. A lot of our shopper teams are asking exactly those questions and are really trying to define at what point will consumers feel uh, more comfortable going back into store or has that changed um, changed forever? So uh, for the person that did ask that question, we would love for you to, uh, to ask some of those questions on the Suzy platform and make sure it's the right answer for you, your brand, your consumer um, and your product category also. And another tactical question that came out, I believe, from Matt's presentation, um, are we seeing more money being put into the stock market and into the property market because of GameStop? Nick, I know you've got a couple of thoughts around this. We're lucky to, to hear. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's specifically because of GameStop and the story around that. I think that was a trend that was already happening. Um, there's a, a few factors related to that. I think, you know, things like government bonds et cetera, aren't giving you the um, return that you used to get. Um, and I think it's also that people are more empowered. Um, you know, there's apps like Robinhood that make it very easy 
um, and very cheap uh, for people to, to do their own trades. Um, obviously, things like GameStop or cryptocurrencies, um, people are seeing some amazing returns, although um, in a risky environment at times. Um, so I think that's definitely a trend that um, we're going to continue to see. Uh, it's going to be interesting, you know, hopefully, uh, if at some point, uh, the pandemic and everything get, gets to a better place, um, you know, what, what that brings in the future in terms of people, um, you know, doing their own investments and things like that. I think it's a trend that's going to continue. Uh, maybe the, the spikes, uh, the peaks and valleys won't be as extreme, but we'll see. Yeah. That makes sense. I think it's the wealth of information that's also available um, to consumers now. It's not you don't have to you know go to a financial advisor and have that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of liquid assets. That information is available today on podcasts, on websites, um, and as you mentioned, the apps such as uh, as Robinhood and Betterment have really made it incredibly simple, easy to understand, and easy to access. And it's really about democratizing the the stock market and uh, and not just reserving it for the few. Absolutely. Awesome. It sounds like, unfortunately, we have lost Wilson Morosa, so I'm hoping that storm has not hit him in Connecticut too hard. Uh, but there was a question that came up regarding uh, his research um, around Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There's a question about the methodology. My understanding, um, and I will confirm and send it out in the follow-up email to everybody, is that it was a survey amongst 15,000 respondents, and it was a NAT rep audience. So hopefully that was able to answer your question there. Um, and moving on to some of the final questions here, we asked our panelists um, you know, on my panel earlier to predict what market research, what the market research industry might hold for the future. And I'm curious from the two of you also, um, what we might be saying this time next year during our State of the Consumer Summit in 2022, what do you think we'll all be sat here saying, Nick? Sure. Um, so, you know, I think what's happened over the course of really the last few months has been an epic change in market research. Um, you know, there were some trends that I think had made uh, Susie a success prior to the pandemic. Um, and the pandemic just accelerated what might have taken two or three years really happened in two or three months. Um, and I think that those trends are just going to continue. Um, speed is important. Um, I think in addition to that, it's about data. Um, so, you know, you're seeing that across the board and there's a lot of companies that can give you access to big data and observable data and things like that. I think it's the pairing of that agile research and the ability for brands to move on their feet um, and back that with a bunch of different data sources. Yes, I completely agree. And I think um, we'll be talking a lot in 12 months about how all of this data is um, moved into storytelling into more of the workflows of different business stakeholders. And so I think we'll continue to see more market research fluency throughout the entire organization, more business leaders really requiring that every team lean on insights and data. Um, so I think that's going to be something that will continue to proliferate. I think also we're going to uh, be talking a lot more about consumers as creators. Um, you know, it still feels like we're on the early side of that. And we're, we're kind of touching on those themes when it relates to meme stock trading or cryptocurrencies. And so um, I'm really curious also just to watch uh, consumers continue to surprise us with the, the types of activities that they do and uh, how they partner with brands to create even better products and services. Yeah, I think the other thing you'll see with data and that's starting already is people having more ownership of their own data. Um, and you're starting to see that definitely internationally and then more, um, more and more in the United States. Um, but I think that's going to create a really interesting relationship in the future. Um, between uh, brands and consumers and certainly in market research. Um, you know, one of the things that we're very proud of and the way that we um, can work with our consumers is they're answering questions. We're compensating them for that data. Um, I think that versions of that is really gonna be the trend. And I think that's really where it should be going. Um, there's a lot of companies that have made a lot of money off of people's data without kind of including them in that transaction in, some, in one way or another. Um, and I think you'll definitely, I, I imagine that's something we'll be talking about this time next year. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, data privacy and data ownership is, uh, is incredibly key. And, you know, that's what I think 
we try to do and think about at Susie, it's not just about asking them to complete surveys and, and give us results. It's really about you know, finding solutions that are right for our clients, but also finding solutions that are right for our respondents as well. As Doreen mentioned, they're so key um, to, to holding it together that to, for us to be able to provide to our clients the iHeart solution and Suzy Live is equally as important for providing our consumers that same uh, that same touch point. And they feel very connected to the brands and, and the research process themselves. And it's incredible the amount of thoughtful answers that they do give to us and they deserve to be compensated and I know they're going to be excited about trying out brand new products as well and uh, so I'm so happy we're adding that offering here. And I Excellent. received by the way one private message from someone asking about how to start with iHuts. So I just wanted to make a note also that you can reach out to any of us, you can reach out to your CSM and we will get you started on that path. Absolutely. Great. Well, that's all the questions that we have for today. So I want to thank you all for joining us for our second annual State of the Consumer Summit. It's been a couple of hours. We've all been together. So thank you so much. Uh, stay tuned for Suzy product updates, for webinars, and for thought leadership pieces coming out all year long. And we'll see you all very soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.